Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to uh, our history seminar. Uh, and it gives me a particular pleasure to welcome our guest speaker today, uh, Patricio uh, Simonetto. Uh, before uh, I introduce him properly, I just want to welcome uh, all of you uh, again. Uh, and just uh, to say for those of you who are uh, coming for the first time, uh, that uh, our history seminar has been running uh, since uh, 2013, and I'm glad to see Karsten, who inaugurated our seminar first speaker. I think it was back in October uh, 2013. So it's always gratifying to see uh, uh, Karsten coming back and other uh, participants, including Ricardo Lopez Pedreros, who gave paper uh, last term. Anyway, just to say that it's a great, great to see you, to see you all. Uh, and uh, uh, as I said, we meet on Thursdays, five o'clock uh, every uh, uh, Thursday of the 10th throughout the academic year. So great to see you all here. Give me a great pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce Patricio Simonetto. Patricio is a Marie Solodowska Cui Fellow at UCL in London. Uh, he's the author of Entre la Injuria y la Revolución, El Frente de Liberación Homosexual en la Argentina. Uh, El Dinero No Es Todo, La Compra y Venta de Sexo en Argentina del Siglo XX, published by Biblos in 2019, which has uh, uh, trans been translated as Money is Not Everything, the Purchase and Sale of Sex in Argentina in the 20th Century, and will be published by the University of North Carolina Press soon. Uh, he was awarded with the Carlos Monsivais Prize from the Latin American Studies Association, and he is currently working on his book project, entitled A Body of One's Own, A Trans History of Argentina, 1900-2012, which will be published by the University of Texas Press, but that is the topic of his seminar today. So without further ado, welcome Patricio and the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, uh, Eduardo. I will start sharing my screen so we can... Okay. Well, uh, welcome everyone. I'm very thankful to Professor Eduardo Posada Carbo for inviting me to participate in the Latin American History Seminar. Uh, today I will share with all of you a little of my forthcoming book entitled A Body of One's Own, A Trans History of Argentina. And to start, I would like to, to share uh, one of the many stories that inspired my book. Raul, Raul Luis Suarez was born in 1882 in Spain. His parents were the baker Modesto Suarez and the dressmaker Isidora Valdez. They immigrated to Uruguay in 1886 with their daughters Raquel and Ada Francisca. Some years later, they moved to La Plata, Argentina. After Raul's father died, they moved to Buenos Aires City to get a job where his mother became a house cleaner until her, uh, her death in 1995. Raquel and her sister ended up in a religious orphanage. In 98, after Ada got married, Raquel traveled to Montevideo and forged her birth certificate to be fully recognized as Raul Luis Suarez. Uh, during those years, Raul got a citizen card uh, in Argentina. Uh, two years later, he married Amalia Gomez, and some months later, he moved in, in with uh, another lover called Matilde. He became quite known in Buenos Aires, for, be, for flirting with women. He got a very good position in the custom office in the city and participated in a very rich male sociability. Nevertheless, his life as a man found a limit. In 1930, he fainted and was hospitalized. The doctors were surprised that he did not have a genitalia that they expected to see under his suite. Raul came uh, back home and two days later, he suffered an uncontrollable emotional distress and died. Based on the neighborhood's gossip, some journalists accused Matilde of poisoning and killing him uh, uh, on selling, for selling the house furniture. And this is a way in which Raul's story flooded the press. Raul's life stresses both dimensions of a central concept of my monograph, thinking bodies in transgression and, and bodies in general as living laboratories and archives. I take a metaphorical inspiration of Marx's idea of living machines about how capitalist societies transform workers' bodies to, to express this idea of that this body's works of laboratory to understand on one, hand, on one hand about the public experimentation with these bodies in order to create social hierarchies and how they were embodied, 
but also in a broader perspective about how trans people experiment with their own bodies to understand the technology they develop, the challenge they face, and how they also deal with this uh, path to be recognized in their gender. Raul body, in fact, became a battlefield. Under a court order, doctors perform an autopsy, and this autopsy was carried on the press for, for the next weeks. Uh, a group of doctors removed his organs, his mammary glands, and his brain. They researched Raul through sex, uh, but, um, uh, but through, a, through a long process that was followed by the press. A, a few weeks after his death, the verdict was that he was a thick woman with developed hips and building breasts. Some journalists were shocked and they write, how did he usurp the civil rights of a man for 23 years? How did he create his voice, his new way of being? How did he create this new character? The case became a public debate, debate in tabloid newspaper that published graphic novels about him and articles for weeks, which shows how gender transgression were central in a broader discussion about urban transformation, modernization, and citizenship in a context of increasing feminist suffragists a struggle and a very mobile society, as we know, was Argentina during those times. The case created a debate among members of the parliament, judges, lawyers, writers, feminist activists, physicians, and journalists. The most surprising opinion was from Susi Ortiz, a journalist from the tabloid Ultima Hora, who openly defended Raul, right to be a man. This article, one of the first traces of a genealogy of a feminist discourse that openly recognized people's sovereignty over the gender. In her text, she refers to Raoul for his name uh, with male pronouns. She defining him as a revolutionary emancipated from the abstract logic of nature and as an example of liberation. She openly defended his right to be a male citizen and said, if he had been able to choose to be a man, the male sex would have gained a good citizen. The last emission of the experience of alignment between the body, gender, and citizens came after death. The state deployed multiple archival practices to reproduce its social orders. Raoul body was in fact archived. The National uh, General Archive archived his bodies, his photographs, along with other mujeres hombres, as they were called in the time, in a collection titled The Ladies Figures. The, the archive is a ruthless, ruthless in preserving categories over time, so Raoul's male embodiment was forcibly placed in a category to which it would hardly fit and tell us a lot about how the sexual sciences at the beginning of the century, as well as how the stain extended their power over trans bodies. However, in, this, in his aftermatch, in which doctors and state regulated pro legacies, uh, his partner, Mathilde, uh, had a, a last chance and she, she got to uh, get here burying him as, as a man. His, his graveyard, which I have a photograph of him, said Raul Luis Suarez, he was buried with male clothes as, as, as being recognized as a man. However, his graveyard has been removed from the, from the Argentinian graveyard because they can't remain for more than 50 years. So my monograph is not just a trans history. It is also a history of a nation itself through trans lens. In, in the famous novel of the travesti writer, Camila Sosa Vichada, Bad Girls, Las Malas, she wrote, if someone would like to make a reading of our nation, this homeland from which we have sworn to die in every hymn sung in the schoolyards, this homeland that has taken lives of young people to its words, the homeland that has buried people in concentration camps, if someone would like to make an exact record of that shit, then he should see the body of the incarnate. That's what we are as a country too, that retinless damage of travesties bodies. The imprint left on certain bodies is an unjust, random, and avoidable way, the input of hate. Tian Karna was 178 years old. Tian Karna had cut of all kinds, made by herself in prison, because it's always better to be in the hospital than in the heart of violence, and also the result of street fights, miserable client and surprise attacks. She then had a scar on her left cheek that gave her a mean and mysterious air. Her breasts and hips were eternally bruised from the beatings she received while in detention, even during the time of the military rule. No, I take it back. That bruises were caused by the airplane oil with which she had molded her body, the body of an Italian mama who fed her, 
pay for the electricity, gas, water to irrigate the beautiful courtyard dominated by vegetation, that courtyard that was the continuation of the park, just as her body was the continuation of the war. Villada placed the beating body of a travesty mother, of her mother, in the center of the national historical narrative. The encarna, metaphorical, metaphorically, refers to travesty's embodiment. In Spanish, encarnar means to embody, which can be read in a novel in a double dimension as a reference to travesty gender embodiment and how the body archives life experiences. Las Malas challenges travesty's marginalization from national narrative and shows the violence that makes this erasure possible. The encarna's bodies becomes the body of the nation itself, an archive of the happiness and sorrows of the country. This book places the making of trans bodies at the core of modern Argentine history. By analyzing a wide range of primary sources located in public, private, and grassroots archives, this monograph addresses crucial themes from the popular portrayal of people in gender transitions to the homemade technologies with which they shape their bodies, such as, for example, the self injection of interesting silicon. The book analyzes the experience of people's body transformation and its decisive yet overlooked impact in the public discussions surrounding the formation of the Argentine nation state and definition of citizenship as a living corporal experience. A body when sent explored how trans bodies were materialized and understood through time uh, in Argentina since uh, the, the, the late 19th century to the present. By doing so, it suffers a refreshing reading of the country's history for those bodies such as the limits of gender belonging and the um, and ongoing corporal experience of citizenship and national formation. Firstly, it explored the history of a wide repertoire of medical and social practices that include cl clothing, cotton, rubber, self injection of ornaments or liquid or industrial silicon, um, etc. Et this book is recognized the daily production of knowledge with which people embody their gender beyond social expectation across institutions and community spaces. It also studies everyday violence is technologies of embodiment with which the state and civil agents sought to control trans embodiment, as for example, the practices of forced, forced haircuts or the denial of access to gender affirmation treatments. Secondly, it examines the transformation of the notion of sex and the development of the multiple meaning that doctors, patients, and social movements, writers, journalists, and judges assign into it. And thirdly, it established a connection between trans embodiment practices and gender normative technologies with which cisgender people, uh, men and women, uh, embody themselves. This study focuses on the experience of people who move away from the gender they were assigned at birth, people who cross over the boundaries uh, constructed by their culture to define and contain their gender. This means that this book brings together people with different experiences and different identities from cross-dressing to travestismo and intersexuality. While working with it, this text addresses, or this book will address uh, the language of its time critically. The text uh, explores how this transition, usually named as sex change during the 20th century, offers an analysis for, for historical analysis and considers its multiple layers to show uh, how uh, it defines now how it defines this, this multiple experience of crossing gender. The historical analysis of the transgressive frontier offers insights into the conflictive languages with which people have made sense of these fluid changes. Focusing on the border in space and defining as sex change help us to explore how this concept changed over time from a vague reference to it allergal alleged impossibility of transforming one's sex through clothing and homemade techniques done in the first half of the 20th century to the biotechnological procedures and its fury politicization at the end of the 20th century by paying attention to the multiple and conflicting meanings that the idea of sex change acquired. It also allows us to study practices beyond precarious sexual identities. It is a vector to examine practices that did not always correspond with a stable identification or a period of history. It is a window for me, to the heart of the 20th century gender architecture, the idea of sex itself. A body of one's own contention core, this book contention core, is the trans knowledge, practice, and technologies played a vital role in shaping the modern notion of sex as a central legal, cultural, and social body logic. Although not a medical history, this book shows how sex conceptualization and practices related to it deeply changed as a consequence of the consolidation of medical fields, such as endocrinology, the global circulation of sexology, the popularization of articles in the press about trans people, uh, etc. 
Uh, for example, uh, and, and so it explores how this idea of success will change through times. However, as the book also showed, these new possibilities uh, created by this transformation of the idea of new sex also resulted in new tensions with new social actors, especially with policymakers and law enforcement agents who tried to control the diverse interpretation of what sex was and the possibilities that the science was created to transform this, this condition. Parliamentarians, judges, doctors, and bureaucrats tried to regulate possible body modification as a consequence of the belief that they put in arrest the reproduction of the population assumed as the as key for the national development. Justice agents rejected an increasingly influential medical perspective by claiming that the only way of determining legal sex status was by examining genital sex appearance. This monograph uh, focuses in particular on Argentina the 20th century from the consolidation of the modern notion of sex as a central metaphor of nation building uh, at the end of the 19th century to its crisis with the legal recognition of self-perceived gender in 2012 and the creation of a non-binary document in 2021. Argentina in particular offers a particular useful context for study trans embodiment because unlike other countries where sex change surgeries uh, access was restricted but still allowed under certain conditions uh, since the sexes, for example, United States, or where existed a legal vacuum, as for example, Chile. From 1944, Argentina banned any intervention that led to a sterilization, and from 1967, explicitly banned a surgery that affected reproductive organs. Uh, different legal code have penalized homosexual and trans public sociabilities in the 30s onwards with explicit condemnation of people who dress as a couple of sex. This criminalization obviously transformed trans life in, in a very precarious condition, reducing the life expectancy to 35 years, between 25 years and 40 years. I would like to summarize briefly some of my book contribution. First, this book challenges previous studies in the history of sexuality that over focused on sexual oriented identities or their over experience and particularly male homosexuality. This means that the usual understood history as a teleological development of identities and reduce the gender transgression to the prehistory of male homosexuality. By centering the study of the body experience of transgression gender norms, this book brings together people with diverse identification and tries to understand how they experience these transitions and how they portray or transform the Argentine notion of sex itself. Second, this study provides a privileged insight on the everyday making of citizenship, which, uh, which have become a central concept of our of historical uh, work, where some study have mostly focused on the status, the legal and cultural meanings which makes someone a citizen. This book endorses the emphasis on practices, the activity of being a citizen itself. Like early literature, by analyzing a wide spectrum of state and community politics of belonging as both experiences, this book approaches to citizens as a material, legal, emotional, and practical processes that produce a person as part of the social group. This monograph pays attention to both what makes someone feels and what makes society recognize them members of the community. So in this sense, my book used a, a racial conceptualization of citizenship that's situated in the everyday acts, such as walking down the street or being named by your own names, um, and, and, and explore this, this more daily dimension of the, of the, of the citizenship as a, as a body experience. Third, following the past arguments, by understanding nationhood and citizenship as embodied living experiences, this book opens the question about the limits of historical universalization. If gender history was useful to show how the premises of universal citizenship were in base of the modernity were in base of the exclusion of women, this study will show how periodization based on the binary dictatorship and democracy can blur when we focus on trans or queer experiences because the state violence practices continue beyond democracy and dictatorship in Argentina. Moreover, this project provides a queer and non technological history of embodiment technologies. It shows how people can provide unexpected uses for technologies such as contraceptive pills or produce knowledge about hormonal doses and even develop surgeries, such as a self injection of surgery of, of silicon for producing breasts or, or, or bumps. It also helped us to understand how technologies associated with different temporalities coexist in, in, through time, as for example, surgeries and the use of clothing, uh, and, and there is not a technological development in which one replaces another. 
This monograph shows how understanding broader social, political, and cultural process through the body can transform our analytical apparatus and bring us a further methodological challenge. Beyond the more classical challenge for archival research, this book contributes to the broader question about working with documented body experiences. This book tries to land abstract processes such as nation and citizenship building to the body to understand how the police torture or experimented with all law medical practices have been archived in people's bodies. And in this sense, this book pays attention to the challenges of reading through documentary sources and testimonies of embodiment of embodiment of the life itself. We're working with the traces of silicon, joy, and the scars of violence. The history, this history remembers that we are all archiving life, but that some bodies are violently marked as natural or artificial, artificial products. What are the effects of this, of this mark? This book to talk about the archival and experimental dimension of a body for two main reasons. The first of it is because the public portrayal of those bodies um, of, of, of usual are, of, became uh, in a space of public experimentation for scientists, policymakers, and journalists that became central to defining the changing frontiers of gender belonging and embodiment through the 20th century to open questions about the alleged artificiality of natural or the natural belonging to align citizenship, nationhood with, um, with, with understanding or the changing understanding of what sex was through time. Likewise, the state agents attempt to police sex uh, by pushing those practices of embodiments to the margin of the law, creating a space of body experimentation of, of, of embodying gender, which in some cases, for example, as the in self-injection of hormones, of silicons, led to dangerous, a, a very precarious path. Uh, the interconnection of those experimenting uh, with the body plasticity and the public portrayal of those experiment experiences built a famous and sometimes uh, community, you know, a very, uh, um, build a widespread community knowledge for gender embodiment. So this book explores the methodological challenges of, of seeing this both sides, the disciplinary and the self-experimental uh, dimension of, of, of this arch archive processes. Um, so this monograph, uh, as a final point of this methodological, is guided by a simple methodological principle that is trusting of the words of the people used to give meaning to their own life. It just raises the healing power of history beyond the rule of rules of the archives, distrusting the power of those who classify these stories. It is a call to understand our chapters, our subjects on their own terms, as the necessary respect for their sovereignty over their own body. A call to distrust, owing knowing the rest, a past that is represented as a stable and inflexible. So uh, the book is organized in five chapters. Uh, the first chapter studies the practices and portrayal of public transgression in the early 20th century, the late 19th century, the early 20th century. The chapter is interested in allegedly deviating nonconforming gender expression before the emergence of biomedical gender affirmation practices and the state open intervention against queer public sociability in the 30s. The chapter offers a refreshing perspective that focuses on gender embodiment experience over sexual oriented identities. So it's a discussion against those studies focus in homosexuality as an identity. And this chapter explores the relevance of gender transgression for the definition of sexual and racial boundaries in Argentina and how some people negotiated the social boundaries in their own and their daily life. The second chapter analyzes the medicalization of sex change in the mid 20th century. This chapter explores the portrayal and practices that affirm with which these people affirm their gender. Uh, the gender self-perception uh, under medical guidance. It is a particular interest in how the narrative of the brown body, the idea of being trapped in a brown, in, in a brown body, uh, mediated a broader and social experience of, of, of a generation of the myth between the 40s and 50s. And likewise, this chapter studies how the conflict for defining the limits of the power of science to transform sex became a main issue in Argentina in the mid 20th century and led to, to the regulation that banned sexual practice, sexual transformations you know, in, in the 60s, well, in the 40s and then in the 60s. The third chapter explores the global making of travestis culture in Argentina. This chapter argues that worldwide circulation of theater performance, local transformers, performance, journalists, articles, and books participate in the renovation of what was travestis culture. Uh, the chapter analyzes how the emergence of travestis artistas in the mainstream cultural circuit transformed the local queer embodiment culture because it 
allow the popularization of certain uh, technologies among the community, but it's also transformed a certain definitions of how they value their own body practices by bringing the idea of nature and realness to the, to the language with which they usually value those bodies that were not transformed and were naturally female as, 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 as a value, as a community value. That, and this will change in, in the 80s with the, with the introduction of the silicon injection. So the, the full chapter, as you see, this uh, person self-injecting silicon silicon in their bodies, analyze how male and female trans people challenges a state restriction by producing knowledge and homemade technologies to affirm their gender, is it brought the history of a vast repertoire for medical and social practices that include clothing, cotton, rubber, self-injected hormones, or liquid industrial silicon, the use of prosthetics, documents, fortune, and many others. This chapter explores how people experimented with their bodies performing them in living laboratories, to affirm the gender beyond legal and medical control and how this pushed them to precar very precarious conditions and sometimes to death. And finally, it introduces how activism and social movements formulate an alternative body discourse that challenged uh, this biotechnological promise of the legal correct body as a desire for, for trans people. And the fifth uh, chapter, the final chapter, analyzing how the travesty intersexual movement politicizes the right for gender affirmation, you see the image, you know, the right of change, sex change. It is started with daily violence, resistance, alternative discourse, and the collective battles uh, as embodiment technologies. And it points how the material experience of exclusion and practice of collective belonging participate in the making and the making of ephemeral experience of citizenship. Uh, this chapter, uh, focus on the formation and the convergence of two agendas, one focusing on the rise of free public circulation in the city, and other uh, agenda was related with this affirmation of the right to, to sex chain, and how the convergence of these two agendas in the 21st century allowed a big transformation that was the gender identity law in Argentina, which is a law that guaranteed many things, but you, we can't say two main things. One is the, the right of every person to define their own gender, the right to access freely to any gender affirmation practice through a public or private uh, health care. Um, and finally, uh, this book has, at least for me, a mandatory methodical, methodological consideration. But writing this historical narrative, I try to place myself, as all of us do, in relation to these documents. Even if sometimes Chill. I try to formulate questions about what this about these archives inform about myself as a researcher and about our society, in particular about Argentina. Maybe this comment is a little naive, but while navigating the archival documents, I usually felt ashamed. It was impossible to avoid connecting those newspaper chronicles laughing about trans protests or police reports about the imprisonment and torture with my own experience as a cisgender gay man and the several times in which I participated in situations in which these comments and these jokes were reproduced. Like many other Argentinians, I participated in a broader audience that consumed these articles and TV shows against trans bodies, uh, which were maybe one of the most potent mechanisms of cisgender self-affirmation and uh, of promotion of trans Russia and trans violence against trans people. Like I pointed out, I think that we have a pending history of cisgender embodiment, right, of cisgender people. I don't compare my life with us right now on these archives because I don't have to struggle to be called on my name. However, I hope this book will contribute to show how society marks our, of our embodied practice as natural in contrast with other practices uh, defined as artificial and how these distinctions produce precarity. While talking with some friends in London, for example, one of them describing how he requested his doctor to administer himself testosterone to mitigate the aging effects of his sexuality and body. Other friend told me that when he was seven years old in Venezuela, he underwent a surgery to take out the fat on his chest because children in the school told him that he had tics. Even I found myself going through different experience with which I connect my body materiality with how I expected to be read, as for example, a very expensive dental health treatment that has already failed three times, which is speak, I think, uh, more broadly about the cultural frames about how class, race, and gender are embodied and read in Argentina. 
So this book contributes to a history that describes the body as a material experience. It, ar it argues that neither class, gender, nor racial belonging is produced without or outside our body. So I, I hope to bring this, this discussion uh, to the table. While I was working with this life that, that seemed a colossal otherness, I struggled with little decisions such as choosing names or pronouns. Somehow I felt myself dissecting role as the doctors are aware, dissecting role bodies, trying to understand the way his life and echoes transform the modest sexual experience. I'm aware of the, of, of the risk of every methodological decision that guides this book. And I, I know this, I use a methodology based on an attempt to interpret a changing embodiment desire. And to do so, I decided to believe in some documents more than in others. So this book proposes an enrolled journey through archives in which I try to distrust, first of all, or myself. It's also aimed to contribute to its archives of what I'm trying to call the archives of shame, which is the recollection of those moments of complicity with which every one of us participated in making trans a Russia possible, which I think is an indispensable condition of enunciation without with which any line of the book I'm hopefully finishing this year uh, is impossible. And it's a call for us to build another islands, to break up these little moments of conform and to make possible a new desirable trans future. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patricio, for uh, your lucid presentation of the project and the book. I gather uh, the book for what from what you told us is well advanced, right? You are already making good progress. Uh, so 